So welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. This is Ask the Expert with Darlene Williamson, who will be chatting with us about apraxia and how it can coexist with aphasia. I'll be your host for this hour long session. My name is Jen. I'm part of the team at the National Aphasia Association, a nonprofit organization dedicated to advocating for people with aphasia, their families, care partners, and care communities. Uh, we've received some really great questions that have been submitted over the past few weeks about apraxia. If you have any questions during today's session, please feel free to enter them into the Q&A chat. We will try our best to answer as many of those questions as we can. And now I'm honored to introduce our panelist, Darlene Williamson. Darlene is the president of the board of directors at the National Aphasia Association and a leading expert on apraxia, drawing from her 35 plus years of experience working as a speech language pathologist. Darlene, thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Jen, and welcome everyone. It's so nice to have you join us. I, where I said I have no idea how many people are out there. Um, so I'm guessing that you're all interested in this topic or you wouldn't have signed in. I'm going to go through about five slides just to be sure we are all on the same page and we have some of the same basic information. I don't wanna take up too much of the hour with this because really what I wanna do is answer your questions, but this will answer some questions. And again, it will give us, keep us all grounded. So I'm going to stay on this title slide for a minute. Why? Because um, the first word is adult, because we are talking tonight about apraxia in adults. It can and does occur in children, but we're not on that topic tonight. Um, because it is acquired, or it means that a person has developed their speech and language skills, and then through a neurological event, um, the, the, those skills were interrupted. And so the apraxia was acquired. It wasn't something you were born with or, and it's not a developmental disorder. And we're basically talking about apraxia of speech tonight. There are many different kinds of apraxia. There is an oral motor apraxia, there's a dressing apraxia, there's an oculom oculomotor apraxia, there's an ideational, there are, there's a long list of different kinds of apraxia. Tonight, we're going to just talk about apraxia of speech. Although I'm happy to answer questions about other types if that comes up. Okay, so what is apraxia? The two things um, that we need to take away from this is apraxia is not aphasia. The next slide is gonna talk about that. Um, apraxia is a movement disorder. It comes under a category of motor speech, but it's not language. The person with apraxia um, has difficulty selecting the right movement needed to produce the speech, programming it, and certainly programming a sequence of movements to say a whole word. You think of one single word, how many different movements go into that word. So it has to be, the movements have to be found in the brain, selected, programmed in the sequence, and then carried out. And I put that little icon up there because it really is a disconnect between what's in your brain language-wise and what you're able to produce um, with your speech. However, apraxia has nothing to do with weak or paralyzed muscles. It's, an, it's neurologically based. It's not a muscle um, issue. Okay, so then let's separate out apraxia and aphasia. They are two very different challenges and very different consequences. Almost everyone in my experience, and in fact, in all the years I've worked with this, I have never met anyone 
who has a praxy of speech who didn't have at least some measure of aphasia. So it's, um, it's makes it tricky. I call it a double whammy because everyone is going to have some language as well as the apraxia. The reverse is not true, however. Not everyone with aphasia has apraxia. And so someone out there is going to be smart enough to say, well, how many people with aphasia have apraxia? And honestly, we do not have good numbers about that. So um, we simply don't know. But because they coexist and they, they happen together, it makes diagnosing how much aphasia, how much apraxia, and how, how do we go about dealing with both of them? And so um, I will talk about that in a little bit. But um, again, because the two occur together, it it's muddies the waters. The other um, possibility that can occur is called dysarthria. And that can coexist with either af aphasia or apraxia. But dysarthria is due to a weakness in your muscles. So it's a whole different ice cream flavor. The muscles are weak and it causes a whole different kind of presentation that is, um, should be and frequently is relatively obvious that one side of the face droops, there can be drooling, there can be difficulty eating. So dysarthria is the third um, possibility but it is more easily distinguished from aphasia than apraxia is. Um, so what does apraxia look like? When someone has aphasia, they are searching for words. And um, if you observe someone carefully enough, you see them searching, searching for these words. And Sometimes the wrong word comes out. Sometimes um, someone says the word table for chair or able for table. Um, but they are their language, their word mistakes or, or issues. In apraxia, the person is looking for the movement. So the individual knows in their brain what it is they want to say. That's very clear. What is difficult is how do I say it? So if you're wanting to say the word table and you, you're starting to try to say it and it's, nope, nope. There are um, trials that are incorrect and very frequently the person recognizes their error but that's not what I'm trying to say at all and it's, it's very frustrating. It's frustrating for the person. It's frustrating for the communication partner. Um, also in apraxia, you will see times when speech comes out, a word, two words, three words, four words that are, are formed perfectly fine. They just automatically pop out. And um, we'll, I'll mention this um, in a little more detail, two slides away from this, but um, a person with apraxia um, might say, oh, for gosh sakes. And yet, if they were trying to say that, they would be looking for the movement and it just wouldn't come out um, with no errors the way it did. Um, so you see what, I, what is called groping, looking for the movement. Typically, the longer the word, the harder it is for the person to say. And that is a, a task that is used by speech pathologists to take a look at apraxia. But um, someone with apraxia frequently, if you can get them going with counting or saying the days of the week or the months, or something that's very rhythmical, it, the, the connection starts flowing and there will be instances of this automatic speech. 
which is separates it from aphasia, makes it look and sound quite a bit different than aphasia. So what does speech therapy for apraxia look like? Um, generally, this slide is going to just say generally. And I put all these little different plants here because there is not just one way to go about um, dealing with apraxia. There are, it, it has to be individualized and that's point number one. We also have found and know that the more functional the work is, the better the results are. So rather than simply practicing a list of predetermined words that an individual has no interest in saying, um, you do much better if you're dealing with words that someone needs and wants to use on a daily basis. But apraxia therapy has to be structured <clears throat> in order to build these motor memory patterns in the brain. There have to be lots and lots and lots and lots of repetitions. Um, when one of the clinical trials that I did at one point in time um, showed that to really bring a particular sound or a phrase or a script under your belt, um, it needed about 300 repetitions. So it is something that requires a lot of time and effort and dedication to overcome this disconnect in apraxia. The, the feedback is important, although um, generally individuals recognize their own errors, but it's nice to always um, be sure that there is both, there, there's positive feedback that came out well, or that's not exactly the movement you're looking for. And always, 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 um, we don't want anyone to be dependent on something um, in order to produce their speech. We want to, the goal is to develop independent speech. Um, so a few examples of some treatment approaches that are sort of general categories of a treatment, treatment approaches. There's a phonetic approach that goes um, systematically and sequentially through the various sounds that, are, that we use to make speech um, and reestablishing the ability to make those sounds. There is a key word approach. It is um, quite common for people to have some sounds that are easier to find than others. So we start with words and sounds that are doable and are um, within reach, and then pair them with more difficult words in that kind of approach. A prompt approach is an actual hands-on um, kinesthetic touching the articulators to give um, feedback and stimulation as to how you want the mouth to move. Melodic intonation therapy. A lot of people know about this and have heard about this. This is um, bringing out these um, articulatory movements or these motor movements through rhythm. And um, the purest form of MIT is very repetitious with rhythm, but there are a lot of variations in it. The one thing about melodic intonation therapy is it's nice to do things rhythm, rhythmically, but there has to be something built in to get away from the rhythm eventually um, so that the person can be independent and speak. Scripting is a uh, therapy technique that's used in aphasia and very, very useful in apraxia where a prescribed sentence or group of sentences is set up and the person practices it over and over and over and over and over again until they build up the motor memory patterns. And one way to support that and help it is video modeling where someone uses their lips to say the words 
and the person follows the lips. So one thing I want to say about therapy is with apraxia, if, if you think of apraxia, um, again, as a movement or motor issue, and it is, compare it to learning a musical instrument or doing a sport like golf or um, skiing, where you've got to make your body do a certain thing in order to get down that hill. Or, you know, if anyone out there golfs, you know, there are about 75 things you have to do every time you hit the golf ball um, with where your feet are. And it takes you doing it over and over and over and over. You're clumsy at first. Um, same with the piano. You have to work very hard to bring those movements under your fingers so that when you go to the keyboard, you're comfortable doing it and you're not searching for how you go from this key to that key or this chord or that chord. Um, so um, just a few tips and then I'm done. I went over a little bit. Um, as always, allow extra time to communicate. The individual is looking for the correct movement. Um, repeat or clarify what you heard the person say. Be sure you're getting the message across. Don't interrupt or predict, throw in words. Always good to set a framework. Are you talking about where you want to go? Are you talking about what happened yesterday? Yep. Okay, then that narrows it down. Always find alternate ways of communicating. Um, some people um, would you will can use a paper and pen. Um, some people can use pictures or picture books or apps or something um, when the motor system doesn't engage the way they want it to. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. The goal here is to communicate. So bring in as many tools as necessary. Acknowledge the frustration. I know it's hard. It's hard for you. It's hard. It's hard. It's okay, but don't give up. Let's keep going. And um, there's a few resources here um, that are printouts about apraxia. Um, I assume these can be put up on the NAA website so you can get them um, afterwards. And the one at the bottom is one I, I just made for a friend of mine who went into a long-term care facility and we're hanging it in his room so everyone who enters knows that this gentleman has apraxia and um, what, what that means and what they need to do to best communicate. So with that, I am going to um, pull this down and we'll just take some questions. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'm going to start off the question portion with some questions that were pre-submitted. Um, okay, there we go. Sorry, just give me one second. Okay, so English is my first language, but even then I sometimes find English terms to be a bit confusing. And so when it comes to medical terms, even more confusing. Um, we had some questions asking about the difference between ataxia with a T and apraxia. Yeah, that's a, they look very much alike, don't they? <laughs> and they are two medical terms. So um, remember that apraxia is this disconnect and a difficulty initiating volitional movement. So you know what the movement is, can't get your motor started to do the movement. Ataxia is an incoordination of muscles. So um, they are really um, an apple and an orange. Um, there is no um, lack of coordination or weakness in apraxia, but in ataxia, um, the, um, it can happen in your body too, but in your oral, in your face, in your oral cavity, um, your tongue might be weak and you have difficulty controlling it or your lips. Um, it, so it's, um, again, it's an incoordination, not a 
um, a lack of initiation. They actually look quite different, even though the words look the same. Yeah, that, that always confuses me. I think with medical terms, there's always one letter <laughs> off and exactly. something totally different. <laughs> um, one question we had was about diagnosing apraxia. Who is the person that would diagnose, diagnose apraxia and how would you test for it? Well, the answer to that is um, a speech language pathologist does the diagnosis of apraxia. Having said that, um, your neurologist could and should certainly recognize the presence of apraxia, although it's been my experience they don't always um, recognize it or at least um, communicate well to the family about it. So um, it falls under the umbrella of the speech language pathologist to, um, to do a, a good thorough assessment and to tease out how much of what the um, difficulty communicating, how much of that is aphasia and how much of it is apraxia. So um, there, are, um, there are standardized tests to look at aphasia. There are standardized tests to look at apraxia. But a few, um, a few sort of quick and interesting thoughts are, as I mentioned earlier, um, the longer the word gets, the harder it is for the person to say. So um, if you do something like, um, say this after me, will, willful, willfully, a person with aphasia would likely be able to repeat that. A person with apraxia might get the one syllable, the two syllables would be harder, but then three gets even harder. And one kind of um, um, interesting, but something that separates um, aphasia from apraxia is, again, I, I mentioned earlier that automatic speech can sometimes be, um, be very intact in a person with apraxia. So you could ask that person to count from one to 20. And once they get going, um, they might have um, a very good rhythm and go from one to 20 without any difficulty. Um, and then say, now start at 20 and count backwards. And the person with apraxia is suddenly going to have um, a great deal of difficulty finding those movements. Um, okay, I got started with one, two, three, four, that came easily, but not so easy to go 20 and then find that 19 and 18. Um, and that typically, you wouldn't see that in aphasia. So that's one kind of thing that separates it out. Um, and let me think about standardized tests. <sighs> yeah, I, I, I hope that's a complete enough answer. Yes, that was great, thank you. Um, yeah. Our next question is, what are some ways that apraxia affects daily life? Affects daily life, oh my gosh. Um, well, I should say this first of all, is that um, just like in aphasia, there are, um, there are all levels of how difficult the aphasia is or how difficult the apraxia is. So um, in a situation where there is really a very heavy dose of apraxia, um, even getting out single words is going to be um, um, a very difficult task. And so um, all I can say is that it affects every aspect of your life. Um, I mean, we are here to talk all about communication 
And that's the goal. And I know everyone out there is, and me also, uh, we're all frustrated by the lack of knowledge of aphasia. And put a praxy on top of that. And it's like, nobody understands it because um, how can you possibly know what you want to say, but your mouth won't move that way? That seems incomprehensible to the general public. So it affects every aspect of your life. Um, but again, the overall goal is communication. Um, and we always work towards speech, but any form of communication. And remember when I said that almost everyone with apraxia has aphasia. Um, if somebody only had apraxia and that they had no aphasia, then they should be able to read and write, right? Um, because reading and writing comes under aphasia. Um, and so if someone has not as much aphasia, but a lot of apraxia, then they might be able to lean on writing, writing down key words or writing whole sentences or um, whatever it is. So um, that's important to know. Great, thank you. So we actually have a question from someone in our audience who um, would like to come on speaker. Is that okay with you, Jarlene? Okay, so let me, Teresa, hi, you're on. Hi, I'll make it short if I can. I just wanna ask, I had a stroke. Sometimes I would look on the right, but I would say it's on the left. Or I was in a car looking at the left, but I would say it was right. Or up I was going, but I would say down or opposite. How is that learning? And and I'm better now, but how people learn that and how they try to get better, because it's not in a car, you're trying to go right, left, up or down. That's not good. Right. Thank you. Um, thank you, Teresa. Let me say straight away, that's aphasia. That is not apraxia. Um, so that is very common in, um, in aphasia that, you know, you talk about your dog and you use the word cat or you talk about dinner and you say breakfast. Um, there are ways to work through that in aphasia. You can, um, if you're worried about right and left, um, put it on your hand, take a Sharpie and write it on your hand, <laughs> put models up for you that are going to help you in functional situations. But that's an exact example of something that is in the domain of aphasia. That's language. Apraxia is this movement, and that would never happen in apraxia. Great, thank you so much, Charlene. Um, another question that was recently submitted, um, my mom recently had a stroke. The apraxia is definitely playing a role in her recovery. A couple questions. When she gets stuck and is trying to self-correct, but it isn't working, what are a couple of strategy, strategies to try to break the chain? Okay, yeah, um, and this is recent. So, um, so whole communication environment hasn't learned all of the tricks and techniques. First of all, as I said before, acknowledge the frustration. Um, sometimes, especially early on, and if someone is really struggling with apraxia, um, the frustration level gets so high that I don't know how to say it other than you just get knotted up and you just can't get the word out at all. So relax, take a deep breath. Let's go back and try again. Let's, um, let's get some, let's get grounded here. Let's find out what it is you're talking about. We're looking for a single word. Can you um, give me any other information that would help us get to that word? Um, we don't wanna start a game of 21 questions, but we do wanna 
create an atmosphere that is as um, supportive of communication as possible, give every amount of help. Um, sometimes it helps to put out an alphabet board with all the letters on it. Because sometimes someone will go, ah, yeah, bingo, and they go to the letter that they know begins that word. And then great, then you know you're both on the same page, okay. You're talking about something that begins with an F. So you're, you're thinking about this. Now, let's see if we can get the word. Um, again, providing some structure. If you're in a conversation, if there's a specific request, um, it's good to um, compartmentalize it. Are we talking about today or yesterday or how you're feeling or a person so that it um, really gives you as the listener um, ways that you can help to get that word out. Oh, and don't forget, have a, a pencil and a piece of paper um, because sometimes the person can just write the first letter. And then once you get that first sound, um, then you begin the process rolling and the, the connection starts to be made. Thank you. And just um, just for clarification, um, an alphabet board doesn't have to be something fancy, right? Am I correct in saying that it could be something that you just print out, just print out the alphabet and carry with you? Yep, yep. Or if you're already there and didn't bring it, just take a piece of paper and write the letters write all the letters um, and just use that as a, as a, a reference source. Um, as a follow-up, um, at times in therapy, it presents like perseveration, which is repeating a past response for later questions. She realizes it, she, sorry, she realizes it, but struggles to correct it. Is that the apraxia or aphasia or a combination of both in these cases? Yeah, it can be. It can be and likely I could envision it's a combination of both, but boy, that's a great point to bring up, perseveration. Um, and perseveration means that you do something and it's, you know it's not right. You do it again, but you do the same darn thing. In aphasia, just like Teresa just brought up, um, Perseveration and aphasia would be, I want to go left. No, not left. Left. No, it's not left. It's left. And you, that same word keeps coming out and coming out and coming out. In apraxia, it's either going, it's probably going to be a sound that is, it's a, fit. no, it's a, ch. it's a, ch. it's a, ch. and it is 100% counterproductive to keep banging your head against the wall when there's perseveration. What you really need to do is back off, take a deep breath, think about something else, come at it from another direction, or even say, let's leave that one for right now, but we're not going to forget it. We're going to come right back to it in about a minute. The other kind of remarkable um, thing about apraxia is sometimes when you just set that aside and come back, bingo, it's there. But if you keep trying, 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 you really are spinning your wheels into the mud and it's going to be very, very hard to get them out. Good, good point. Thank you so much for that. And thank you for your question. Um, so our next question has to do with memory. Does apraxia affect memory and does memory affect apraxia? And then another comment that we had in the um, chat is, do, can apraxia be a part of dementia? Okay, so those are two separate things. Let me, um, this can be a little bit confusing. Um, so, no, memory is not, Part of apraxia. Apraxia does not affect your memory. And memory doesn't affect your 
apraxia, doesn't cause apraxia or affect apraxia. However, it can be a little bit misleading or tricky because um, working with apraxia, um, we all talk about motor memory. And so it makes it sound like we might be dragging actual memory. <laughs> what it really is, is building a memory for a movement, just like I use the example of playing scales or chords or a musical piece, is um, there's memory in the movement of how you do something but that is completely a different kind of memory from forgetting what happened this morning or forgetting what I just told you. Um, so I can understand why that's confusing, but they're not the same and, and apraxia doesn't affect memory and memory doesn't affect apraxia. Um, and what was the other question? Can apraxia be a part of dementia? Oh. Well, these are great questions. Um, not really, except that there is a form of primary progressive aphasia that is primary progressive apraxia. And since primary progressive aphasia is um, a progressive um, situation, then in that situation, um, it would be a part of a bigger picture. But typically, we don't talk about um, someone having dementia and they have apraxia. Probably language-based, not a motor-based issue. Thank you for that. Um, and now we have some questions about recovery. Um, you talked about repetitions being an important part of therapy for apraxia. Is this kind of considered the best thing to do to make, to make progress or what would be the best thing to do to make progress? Well, there are, let me say this, rebuilding, all of the motor memory patterns to find those movements for producing phrases and, and sentences is a very long process. And unfortunately, um, typically your insurance coverage isn't going to pay for all of that kind of therapy. Um, Although if you get involved in restoring your motor memory patterns through repetition and a phonetic placement approach, um, there is a lot that can be done at home outside the therapy session to stretch your insurance dollars. Um, the overall goal here with everyone who has um, communication issues secondary to a stroke or, or a traumatic brain injury is to be able to communicate. So when we look at progress and look at goals, are we talking, I want to be able to communicate to my family, or are we saying, I want to be able to speak a paragraph? And both are communicating, and both are good means of communicating. So in the process of building these motor memory patterns, which um, could and should be focused around um, the kinds of speech that are functional every day, um, we should always also be looking at providing means for people to communicate tomorrow and next week, not waiting for some months of therapy to reestablish and overcome a lot of the apraxia. So it does not deter um, learning new motor memory patterns to 
use something else, to use a device on your phone that helps you communicate, to try to write, to use a picture book, to use gestures. We all use gestures, so it's normal to try to use gestures. Um, and by the way, there is research out there that supports that the use of certain gestures helps the motor speech to come out. Um, so it is very individualized for um, the, the therapeutic setting for the individual, for the individual's environment, and for where they are in terms of um, how dense or how difficult the apraxia is. Apraxia can be very dense to the point of um, a person is unable to repeat a word, or it could just be something that's occurring within a sentence where you suddenly lose the ability to say a word. Um, so it's very individualized. Um, I, I would say, however, that um, if we're talking therapy and we're looking at how we're going to make the most progress. I go back to some of the, the tips that it has to be meaningful to the person. Um, someone who is familiar with apraxia um, needs to be able to separate out how much of what's going on in terms of um, difficulty with communication is aphasia and how much is apraxia. And assuming the person has apraxia and also aphasia, you attack both at once in most cases. Um, there, would, there, are, um, there are meaningful words and vocabulary and um, things that people want to say that, you, that come from the aphasia that you can work through. Um, forming the patterns to make it um, make the motor system engage. Um, and so it's very, very, um, it's very, very individualized, but I, I hope I've at least covered a little bit of the basics of it. Yes, that was great. Thank you. Um, so actually, someone made a comment in the chat that we, uh, is related to my next question. So Eleanor says, we found that as aphasia improved, the apraxia was more evident. Yeah. Um, True. Yeah. So some of the treatment approaches that you had mentioned seem to be seem to also be approaches for aphasia. So can apraxia and aphasia be treated together, or should um, we be getting therapy separate for apraxia? Um, no, I no, I think I think you have to address both of them at the same time, knowing that the expectation is different. If someone has aphasia but not apraxia, um, then the expectation in therapy is all language based. Um, when you know that someone has apraxia, you're working within a language structure, but also knowing that as the person, as this person just very astutely said, as the language gets better, they, then they know exactly what they want to say, but it becomes frustrating because it just won't um, it just won't come out um, because of the apraxia. And so as you move through the course of therapy, um, it might be a situation where um, it is you see that the aphasia is improving, there's progress. And we need to really switch gears a little bit and focus very specifically on the motor movements for speech in order to keep up with the language because that's very common. I'm glad that person said that. That frequently the language progresses much more quickly. And then you find yourself in a situation where your language is here and your praxis is here, and you have to help bridge that gap. 
But don't forget that as language improves, then writing should improve and the writing should help dealing with the apraxia. Thank you so much for that. Um, how long is apraxia recovery or, and will apraxia ever go away? No, um, I, I am here to tell you apraxia does not go away. Um, I wish it did. Um, I, there are people with diagnosed with apraxia and um, I bet there are a few of them on this Zoom tonight who could fool you and you would say, I don't see or hear your apraxia, but they know that they um, that they are working just a little bit harder to find those movements. And um, one of my um, former, um, well, I hate to even say that they were a client. They, you know, these people are all my friends. Um, even years after she had completed her therapy, every so often she would have a word in her mind that she just could not make her mouth say the word she wanted to say. And she would always write the letter in her hand. So she would get the, the feeling of it in one hand and the, the motion in the other hand, she would write a D or a P. And then she'd say, oh yeah, the word is popcorn or something. Um, and so to a greater or lesser degree, um, it will always, the person will always know they're working a little bit harder to produce their speech. Um, but it is, um, it's always going to be something that's a bit of a struggle. And it definitely gets worse when you're tired. Um, so just like we talked about that perseveration and the frustration. Um, if you are um, just feeling overwhelmed, both with aphasia and apraxia, your speech just is not as good as it could or should be. So um, I always say to never let your gas tank run dry. Just if you think you're running out of gas, go fill it up by sitting quietly for a few minutes, listening to music, do whatever you do that help clears out your head and come back for a fresh look. Thank you, sorry, my mouse got stuck there for a second, um, but thank you for that wonderful advice. Uh, we still have some time for a few more questions. Um, one of the questions we got was, can medicine help with apraxia? Are there any types of medication that we can consider? Yeah. Um, the, basically, I, 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 I want to be clear about this. If there was medicine out there that helped apraxia or aphasia, the professionals that work in this field would know about it, and, and we, we would be so grateful for it, and you would be grateful for it. Um, so the first thing I must say is be very, very cautious about finding things on the internet that make claims that they have pharmacology or medicine of some sort that will cure you. You can take this for two weeks and it will cure your apraxia or your aphasia. That just doesn't happen. Um, having said that, if you're being followed by a good neurologist, and I hope you are, their apraxia is frustrating. Um, you you're, are very likely dealing with it because you've had a stroke. So you have other um, issues in your life. You might have physical issues, you probably have fatigue. Um, there are just a lot of other um, situations that are going on that surround the apraxia that might be responsive to some medication that could help you focus. 
that could help you sleep. Um, so that's really within the domain of your neurologist. Um, but I, I, I can't be anything but honest and just say, please don't be misled by things on the internet that claim that they have, um, you can take drugs and, and you'll be cured. It, it's, it's not there. Maybe someday, not in my lifetime, but I, I hope it happens. Um, our last question is one that comes up quite often. Um, so I'm assuming it happens to many people. Do you have any suggestions to stop someone from finishing your sentence? Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, I, I'm, I'm very definite and very kind of big on being proactive and controlling the communication. And so um, one, one word that um, people with apraxia need to learn and practice is wait, <laughs> stop. But a hand gesture, it works just as well. And it is um, so disrespectful to people with apraxia and aphasia that, and it's, it's certainly often well-intentioned that someone jumps in and thinks they're being helpful by saying the word for you or finishing your sentence. So um, it, first of all, bingo, wait or no, stop. We, um, I always work with my people to learn a script which it says um, I have apraxia um, and the end of it is please be patient and give me extra time to talk. So um, yes, <laughs> please be proactive and stop people from doing that. Wait, 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 learn that word, stop, wait. Sometimes you point to your mouth, I'll get it. Um, and, and take charge of the communication. People are trying to be helpful for sure. Thank you so much. Um, that was fantastic. Um, thank you so much for the practical and helpful information. Just to let everyone know, I've entered the resources that Darlene shared in her presentation into the chat box. Um, we're coming to an end to our webinar today. Is there anything else that you want to say to our audience before I wrap up, Darlene? Oh, gosh, no, thank you so much. Um, I encourage you to follow up um, through the NAA with any questions that didn't get answered or, and um, because I'm involved with the NAA, they'll come right to me. So um, they will be forwarded right on to me and I'm happy to um, give you the benefit of my experience over the years. Um, this is a topic that is very near and dear to my heart and it just, um, it's just difficult to deal with and people with apraxia need every bit of support and respect and, um, and a good professional team working with them. Um, so again, um, just reach out with things that didn't get answered or things that occur to you or specific situations that I might be able to help with. And so in addition to those resources, um, our good friend Mel has put uh, Darlene's email into the chat box and that's just answers at aphasia.org. Um, Darlene, I want to thank you so much for your extreme care and thoughtfulness and for the contribu contributions that you've made to this community. Thank you for being here with us tonight and for sharing so much about Apraxia. Um, I'm just going to quickly share my screen with our audience. Okay. And so to our amazing audience, thank you so much for joining us and for sending over such compelling questions. Um, if your questions weren't answered today, like Darlene said, we'll probably be bringing uh, those questions up at a future Ask the Expert, so please come visit us again. Uh, for more information on aphasia, to find the recordings for today's webinar, and for more information on future events, please visit us at aphasia.org. Um, we also have some other great, we have great resources on there, but we also have a calendar
calendar of online events uh, that meet online. So we have a workout session, a book club, a game club, um, and also a peer-led conversation group for, for professionals with aphasia. Um, these groups are open to people with aphasia, family, practitioners, care partners. Uh, we just want to be very supportive and do it all in an aphasia-friendly space. Uh, also, our next webinar will be on October 21st, and that's an author conversation with Deborah Meyerson, who wrote the book Identity Theft. Uh, we have another Ask the Expert on November 4th called A Conversation About Aphasia and Technology with Brooke Hatfield. Um, and then we have another Ask the Author with Julia Fox Garrison. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to send me an email at jen at aphasia.org. Um, and again, you can find all our information on the screen share. Thank you guys so much for joining us and for being here. I appreciate that we're learning and we're learning together. I hope to see you at the next one. Take care.